today we are talking about uh, Ontario building code. This is a very compact course. So normally you know that uh, these courses are uh, taught in colleges for one semester, but uh, for you, you are professionals and you know the basics and I don't have to go into every detail for you. I just give you hints and uh, important notes that you might need to observe during your design and uh, professional work. The code is uh, divided into three divisions. Division A uh, especially talks about compliance and uh, application provision, and especially objectives and functional statement. Division B is about uh, acceptable solutions. What does it mean? It means that you can totally put division A aside. Every acceptable solution, according to the code, is in division B. In other words, as I said before, all you have to do is to do exactly what is inside division B. There is another solution for you. By using alternative solutions, that will achieve the level of performance required by the applicable, acceptable solutions in respect of the objectives. In other words, if the code says that the door should be designed this way, you design the door that way, and that's it, you are safe. But if for some reason you have to, or you are asked to change something that is not already in the code, it is acceptable in the condition that you can prove that it meets the objectives and functional state. In the work, you are working in a slope, you are working in a secluded area, you are working in the bank of a river or someplace special, that you want to do something special that is not already mentioned in Division B. You are allowed to do that, but if the building authority asks you, please describe for me why did you do that, and is it safe enough, is it uh, uh, fire resistant, is it, it, does it comply with the objectives of the code, it is your duty to demonstrate that it is part nine. <clears throat> when can we use part nine? There are restrictions for that. First of all, it can't be more than three stories high. The building should be three stories or less in height. And building area should not exceed 600 square meters. And the occupancies that can go according to part nine of the building. For example, if the building is the first floor or ground floor is like this, and the second floor goes like that, and the third floor goes like this. The area is calculated from here. So that's the definition of building area just for part nine, or no. definition of building area for the building code? For the building code. Whatever it says building area, that's the definition. When we apply for a building permit, the examiner actually checks both, the OBC and the NBC? Okay. Checks both. Why I put this here is that in places that code is silent, mm -hmm. okay, what you want, it's not always about uh, disputes in court. You want to do a perfect job, you know, satisfactory to yourself. And when you want to do the perfect job, you have to have all the information that is out there. So why not? Why not knowing about the uh, differences between national building code and Ontario? And there are very little differences. Not too many, but there are. The building code does not care about uh, accidental works. So the building code only deals with regular roads and extraordinary roads which are snow and wind and earthquake. 
but there might be also accidents. Let's say there is a there's a road like this, and there's a building over here that you are designing. You know that if a vehicle goes outside the road and hits the building, it cannot sustain the damage. So why not put some landscaping features here, you know? Some flower boxes, some, I don't know, some benches, something that at least reduces the impact. So code doesn't ask you to do that, but uh, I just uh, found this worth mentioning. It traces for your architectural design go like this. Okay. If the span is six meters or less, you can go according to partner. There is no reason for doing extra work. But if some type of special shape, other than the regular conventional type of uh, trusses that they build in uh, factories and bring it for you. If you are designing something special and the span is more than six meters, uh, you have to go according to part four and you need a structural engineer to sign it. So just to clarify, because I didn't realize, like, so architects actually aren't qualified for part four, right? Okay. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, this is my understanding, it's not the law. The law says uh, if you want to do something according to part four, you should be a professional engineer or you can have a BCIN if you have passed a special exam for part four. You know, BCIN has several uh, different definitions. The basic definition is about part nine. But but there are other definitions that are more complicated, that, uh, like cover part three and uh, uh, part four, and uh, I can uh, email you the whole uh, description of BCIMs, but I know there are more than three or five different types of BCIMs. Mm -hmm. So if you are qualified to go according to part four, either you are engineer or not, that's fine. But just to know that you cannot Tell them that uh, you have uh, complied to part line because that doesn't. Why? The reason is that, <coughs> let's say this is your building, and uh, these are the walls that you are using. For example, here is a kitchen, here is a den, here is a bedroom, etc. So you see that there are intersecting elements here. This one holds back this one. If wind comes here, this perpendicular wall, this perpendicular wall, and this perpendicular wall are holding this guy. And if something comes from this side, these guys are holding. And also from the view, you can see this is this is the ceiling, and these are also nailed to the ceiling. So there is a rigid diaphragm on only on every floor that conveys the loads that comes from this side. It's conveyed by the ceiling to every wall that exists in the left and right. So they say for regular buildings, less than three stories high, just make sure that the nailing is proper. Everything is fixed to each other. Then you don't have to worry about windows or airspace. And these are types of lumbers that are uh, very common in construction. Common sizes are 2 by 4, 2 by 6, 2 by 8. But uh, you should be aware that the exact size is not to it is 38 millimeters by 89 millimeters. One major definition of lumbers is according to, to their moisture content. 19% moisture content is acceptable for normal use. 
There are also 15% moisture content lumbers. These are good, but expensive. You don't want to use them because they are more expensive. And there are uh, lumbers that are cheaper and moisture is more than 90%. You cannot use them as a structural element. You can use them in uh, ornaments or, uh, I don't know, for shade but you cannot use them as a structure. So when you go for inspection to a building, one thing that you might want to check is the sign on the lumber. There is a stamp on every single lumber that gives you certain information about the moisture content and about the type of the lumber. So if, if it is not type three, or, and other than these ratios, one important aspect of concrete is the water cement ratio. The more water you put into concrete, it is easier to work. It becomes more liquid, easy to handle, easy to work. But it reduces the strength. So these are the limitations of water cement ratio. See that you have different types of concrete with different allowances of water cement ratio, and uh, there are restrictions about the size. You cannot use any size in any uh, type of wall. And also, there is a restriction about the strength. There are three types of concrete for foundation, for regular walls and floors, and for diaspora. Yeah, that's, that's up to the builder to apply to, right? Well, uh, you know, First, you have to put these uh, notes on the, the design as your responsibility. And other than that, sometimes uh, you are asked to go and uh, supervise and uh, write a letter to the city that I have checked the foundation and everything is in order. Or, or I have checked the floor and everything is in order. For that, you need proof that they have complied to this. If they have bought the concrete, they have shown you the paperwork that says that the concrete that they have bought is according to this regulation. Or if they have built the concrete in place, they have to show their test results that uh, gives you the peace of mind that it was according to I take this opportunity to describe to you uh, the reason we are doing these workshops. You are architects. You know your work better than me, okay? So it is customary that you hire somebody in other field, for example, geotechnical engineer or structural engineer to do that part of work for you. But you have to pay for it, okay? I am giving you enough information that in regular situations, regular buildings, that the client doesn't pay you enough money that you hire a specialist in uh, structure and specialist in geotechnical, etc., etc. you'll be able to do most of the work yourself. And what I'm uh, trying to give you is just the highlights. For example, about the concrete and concreting, it's a whole lot of, uh, you know, there are volumes of books that they teach in, in but it doesn't matter. I, I came from the above. The code is legal. Why? It has passed the parliament. This same code says if you comply to division B, you don't have to worry about anything else. And division B says that if the building is such and such, it goes to part nine. And part nine says these are the only things that you have to worry about. Okay? So if you can do it yourself, why you have to pay the price? That's one reason. Another reason is that sometimes people make excuses. For example, they say, you have to change your design. Why? Because the forms are too narrow. I cannot do this concrete work. Here, I, I showed you the restriction, 80% of the clear distance between forms. So if your forms are like 15 centimeters, 30 millimeters of the maximum size of aggregate. So 
you have the answer for claims. Otherwise, you have to go to common sense and say, oh, maybe the guy is right. Uh, I maybe changed my design from 15 centimeters to 20. You might want to do that, but be aware that you are doing a failure. You think it's more complicated or other than uh, whatever we are talking about, you have to hire a special sentence. That I'm about to say is not in the code, but just for you know, your information, the beginning of this time is the time that you add water to cement. So sometimes when the, the factory is too far away, they put the aggregates and cement in the drum, but they don't add water. And it travels, for example, one hour until it gets to the place. There at, at the construction site, they add the water. So this time begins when water meets cement. Is overlap clear for you? Or, or? Overlap is this. Let's say you have a wall here, and this is the first floor, okay? And reinforcement comes up like this, and when you are done with the first floor, you do the rest of the work and prepare it for the second floor. Here, you put another piece of reinforcement here. This is overlap. Air, return air, intake air, exhaust air openings that uh, I don't go through every detail of that. And the same uh, thing goes to part seven, plumbing. About plumbing, one main issue that uh, we as engineers and architects should know is that we cannot put storm drainage uh, to the other uh, type of uh, drainage systems. For example, sanitary system should be uh, separated from storm drains. First types of drainage valves, some of them work with pressure. When the pressure goes above some, something, they will open up automatically. Some of them are temperature relief valves. And basically, it says that for any type of uh, hot water tank that you are using, there should be enough relief valves. Otherwise, it might explode. And one important point here is that between the tank and the relief valve, you are not allowed to put another uh, specifications for showers. And also, temperature control devices. Temperature control devices mostly are used for air learning. 